It's time for Doc Talk Radio, brought to you by Gilbert Hospital and Florence and Anthem Hospitals. I'm Dr. Ann Borick, board certified in internal medicine, and I'm here to keep you up to date on the latest information pertaining to your health and well being. Welcome to Doc Talk Radio, sponsored by Gilbert Hospital ER and Florence Hospital at Anthem. Joe, Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year to you, Dr. Borek. Thank you. You know, we have a studio full of my family today. This is fun. It is fun. I have some relatives in from, from Pittsburgh, uh, my cousin Paul and my Aunt Diane and my mom and dad. And uh, so it, it'll just be kind of uh, an interesting show. Nice. Open up the lines for, for questions, and, and we'll see how, you know, how the day goes. And for those of you that <laughs> want to go ahead and call in, you can uh, reach us at 480 480- seven four five one zero three three and of course we're going to be on the chat as well so feel free to uh shoot us a message up on the chat if you'd like or just call in and we'd love to take care of you you know i really wanted to start the year off with um with opening it up as a as a question answer to to really open the lines to let those folks listening um call in and and really um have an opportunity to to ask questions you know that's really what this show is about we're exactly two days shy of one year old wow do you believe we've been doing this for a year so we're gonna have to hang out in two days and have some kind of big party i, I or think something. we should i really think we should do like a marathon show do we have something. to invite the whole world though wouldn't that be cool we that could. would be a big party it really would that'd be neat but you know the idea really that uh, gilbert hospital and florence hospital at anthem um, what we set out to do was really as a community service to really open it up to to connect to the community and and answer any questions um, you know, address any concerns really about health and well-being. And what I want to really share with, with you, we'll start out earlier before we were talking about some new health tips that just came out. According to, uh, it was actually in the Journal of American Medicine, um, they came out with these top health tips. And I want to go through that because it's really a nice, succinct way to uh, to take it into the into the new year, 2013. Throw me a quick bone here. Is one of those going to be on my medical exam? It, well, it might be. All yeah. right, all you right. Know, Just making sure. We're talking about Joe's going to be uh, <laughs> tested and see. We're going to get you. We're going to get you certified here. Um, but you know the the message is really simple. I think that, and I think these tips are going to going to show that. Give sleep a chance. And everything we're going to talk about, we've talked about at one point. But we know that people who don't get a good night's sleep are at a higher risk of of medical problems. Clear and simple. And I have to tell you, I did something the other night. I had the best sleep I've had in probably five to ten years. Mm-hmm. I started drinking tea. Okay, and I am not a tea drinker, mm-hmm. but I'm really trying to get off diet soda. It's it's a it's really rough. Right. Um, so I started drinking tea at night, and I bought this sleepy tea, chamomile tea. Chamomile tea. Absolutely. And I'll tell you what, I slept like a rock, mm-hmm. and I never ever do. I'm always up six eight times because I just. I'm always thinking. Right. And, you know, that's important to know. And I think for our listeners to, to really think about what it is you're drinking, even late afternoon, early evening. Um, for me, example, iced tea keeps me up all night. And, and I have chamomile tea. And my family here, you know, just yesterday, last in the evening, I have a, a cup of a chamomile oh, wow. tea because it really works. The message is that when you have the lack of sleep, when we don't get an adequate amount of sleep, what it does is it, it causes the body to to affect the sensitivity to insulin in the body. And there's studies now showing that people who don't get a good night's sleep, there's a higher incidence of depression, higher incidence of diabetes, and most commonly a higher incidence of obesity. People who don't sleep well have a hard time losing weight. And and that's a known fact. And I think moving into the new year, people listening out there, if you're setting goals for the new year, you know, exercise, weight loss, one of them should be a good night's sleep. Do whatever you need to do to prepare your space, make sure that you have, you know, your own quiet space, avoid the caffeine. Um, but, you know, sleep is so important. I'll tell you, I have felt the last two days, I slept good last night too, and I, the last two days I have felt much more mm-hmm. at peace and relaxed with myself to where I'm not snapping at right. the kids and my wife and, you know, just going crazy. I, I'm, you know, feeling much more relaxed That's across great. the board. Mm-hmm. And it's going to help with weight loss as well. So people right think on. you have to exercise, you got to watch what you eat, and you do, but sleep is part of that ingredient as well. Um, the second point that was brought out in this study was that people who drive long hours to go to work actually are at a higher risk of health problems. And I look at myself and I think, okay, I drive to, to Florence every day. According to this study, even people who are physically active, like myself, I work out, um, or at a higher incidence or a higher risk of having health problems 
when you are in the car for a longer period of time driving back and forth to work. So what does that tell us? Well, it tells us that we need to, we need to rethink that. We need to you know, exercise more when we are at work. For example, if you're driving and then you spend eight hours in a, in a chair behind a desk, that's not, that's not good. Studies show that circulation problems, increased blood clot formation, high blood pressure, obviously obesity, diabetes, um, it all kind of lends to the same to the same thing, trying to stay healthy and preventing those things. What do people do for that, though? I mean, is there a, is, is there a tip, like, at work, get one of those things you can squeeze at lunchtime? I mean, you know, it, it's interesting because they have these little um, unicycles that they put under the desk, and more and more we're finding that people have these little bicycles that they put under the desk, and while they're sitting there, like, for example, if you were sitting there now, you can be pedaling. I'd be biking. And that's a really, really great thing to think about doing. Wow. Um, so just, you know, again, another thought. One of the things that really struck me in this was cultivating kindness and humility. Now, that we're looking at the brain, we're looking at the baby boomers, we're looking at you know, memory, and the memory and the onset of dementia and all of that. What they found in this study was that people who are kind, people who really you know, cultivate a sense of um, you know, positive thoughts and, and those kinds of things have actually a, a healthier brain when it comes to looking at the brain and the function of the brain. And I thought that was really, really interesting. In fact, the recap of this study shows that, you know, just add one healthy thing and be humble and moving into the new year, that's the recipe to really move into a healthier life in this 2013. So I think that's really interesting um, information to kind of pass out. Eating, obviously, is something that we've been talking about on our show. Not necessarily avoiding foods, but what can we do to eat to stay healthy? You know, I'm having a real you know, problem with that because I've really, rather than try to just go on some kind of diet, which has never really worked for me my whole life, I've been in great shape and in terrible shape and in great shape and terrible shape. Right. So I've been trying to cut things out and, and I've managed to cut out a lot of the, the, the fats and the mm -hmm. greasy stuff and all that. But then you end up going to these artificial sweeteners and now I've been reading a lot about those and it's kind of depressing me because a lot of them say that that's worse than eating the regular stuff. So it's like, great, I've just went from... Mm -hmm. you know. The one thing, if there's one message that we can get out about eating and what to avoid and what to not to avoid, if we can avoid the, the high fructose corn syrup, high fructose corn syrup, if you look on it, look, read the labels, look at it, it's an artificial you know, fructose um, sweetener. If we can avoid that, basically what we would do is we would decrease the incidence of weight gain by like 45%. It's amazing, and, and if you think about how this works, regular sugar, glucose, tends to, in the body, the, the mechanics in the body, it makes us feel full. It, there's a trigger that tells the brain, that tells us in the satiety center in the brain that makes us feel full. Fructose does exactly the opposite. It leaves the brain feeling like there's a craving. So the more fructose you eat, the more your brain feels like it's hungry, and it's a vicious cycle. Does this, does this go for the same when you eat fruits that has fructose? No, natural fruits is, is totally so different. This totally is the high different. fructose gotcha. corn syrup um, that I think when we were talking to uh, this, this past, well, probably within the last month or so, we had a rheumatologist on the show, mm -hmm. um, and high fructose corn syrup came up. There's a higher incidence of you know, arthralgias and arthritic problems and gout, particularly gouty arthritis, is exacerbated by this high fructose corn syrup. So probably the, the one message that I would put out there for this new year is to read labels and av if you can just avoid that boy that would be a huge step in the right direction and we're talking about even things like pancake syrup absolutely so, That's so right. this is why then and, and i never knew this and i'm guessing this is why people now are going organic absolutely to get rid of the high fructose corn syrup and mm -hmm. try to find things closer to tapping it right out of the tree exactly wow you know honey i mean the natural you know honey that's what i'm eating in my tea some the, honey the antibodies nice. the protective effect for that um, is really, really beneficial. You know, there's a lot of allergies going on now. Um, we're seeing a lot of illness, and we were talking about, you know, in the clinic, we're seeing people who, you know, have these lingering upper respiratory infections that are going on for, you know, four or five weeks. But allergy is a big thing, and, and when it comes to honey, the message that I want to get out in terms of honey is that if you do have allergies, if you use honey that is harvested in the local area, the, the pollination comes from that local area, and what it does is it gives you the antibodies to fight the pollinations, the pollens in that area, so it helps to protect you against allergies in the area that you live in. Do you know the place that I get my animal food? The daughter of the guy that, 
that runs the big mills, mm-hmm. she has like a thousand beehives. Really? And that's all she does is she makes honey, and it's wonderful. That's where we get it. I'm gonna next time we go down, I'm gonna get you a nice big bottle of that. That's great. I mean, it's for very sure. very it's good. It tastes terrific too. It's great for people with asthma. Looks a little different. W- in what way? I different mean, it, color it, it, a little bit. Mm-hmm. I mean, but and it's real thick. But it's wonderful. It's probably really fresh. It really yeah. fresh. And that's the way to go. I mean, that's really if we're if we're looking at maintaining health, preserving health and wellness, these are the changes that, that have to be made. And honey is not that stuff that comes in the little packet at KFC. Exactly. My kids did not know that. Really? They thought that was honey. I'm like, that's not honey. Mm-hmm. I tried the real honey, and what a difference. That's that's huge. Do I see that? I'm, I'm going to go ahead and start grabbing some okay. calls. Okay, that sounds good. While Joe's doing that, I want to just, one thing I want to talk about today is um, something that we really haven't talked about too much, and that is multiple sclerosis. You know, um, I want to kind of just bring out, I've not had a neurologist on the show yet, and we're going to hopefully this new year have a neurologist and a neurosurgeon on the show. But it's a demyelinating disease. And basically what it is, is there's a process in the the body where the the sheath or the, the fatty covering, the protective sheath around the nerve Begun, begins to break down, and, and the process is called demyelination. And multiple sclerosis is basically a disease process that, um, that is manifested by the, the neurologic system being unprotected. That's probably the best way to, to describe it. it. It affects women more commonly than men, um, usually in the age between 20 and 40. So it's in the you know, young, mid-adult uh, um, and we don't really know the cause of it. There's some studies looking at, you know, is it a virus that triggers this? Is it a genetic, you know, manifestation? But people that have multiple sclerosis can live long, normal lives. Um, and then for whatever reason, some people who are diagnosed with MS, particularly if it's a, if it's a male, can be very uh, debilitating and end up in a wheelchair and so forth. Um, but what happens is inflammation occurs. And for whatever reason, there's a trigger in the body whether it be a virus, whether it be a genetic um, malfunction, you know, within the genetic genome of the, of the body. But the, the sheath surrounding the nerve uh, begins to break down. And if you think of an electrical wire and, you know, the, the, the covering of the electrical wire, that covering becomes shredded. And over time, that wire becomes more um, available, uh, more exposed, and so what happens is that the firing of the nerve, nervous system becomes erratic. And people develop muscle spasms, balance problems, um, a whole host of different symptoms. From a muscular system standpoint, probably the most common symptom that we see in people that are manifesting the symptoms um, of multiple sclerosis, difficulty with balance. There's a, there's a disconnect between you know, the arms and the legs and the brain. And so that, that myelin sheath, remember I said, becomes shredded, and you don't have that clean connection, and so that's what happens. Numbness, tingling, uh, muscle spasms can occur because there's, a, again, a misfiring of the, of the nerves. Tremors, weakness, those are the symptoms that sometimes can be very nonspecific but can lead to putting the diagnosis together uh, consistent with MS. We can develop bowel or bladder problems in people that have multiple sclerosis. Um, And again, anything in the body that is controlled by the nervous system can become erratic and can become dysfunctional. So you have, you know, dysfunctional bladder system, um, you know, GI problems and and so forth. Double vision, blurred vision is a very hallmark symptom of of MS. Um, How do we treat it? Well, you know, MS is really difficult to treat. And those of you listening, if you know anybody that has multiple sclerosis, the treatment really is directed toward um, controlling the symptoms. I mean, there's really not a cure at this point, um, but it has to do with really targeting the immune system, targeting the muscles, trying to quiet the spasms, quiet the tremors. You know, those are the kind of things. Pain control. Um, you know, sometimes steroids and those kinds of uh, treatments, we, we use col- um, medicines that help to decrease the erratic spasms of the bladder. But MS basically is something that we don't have a treatment for. It's, uh, we don't have a cure for, rather. We, we treat it. We treat the symptoms. But I wanted to kind of just bring that out because I've seen a few people recently with exacerbations of, of multiple sclerosis. What do I mean by that? Well, when we say exacerbation, it, we're talking about kind of a waxing and waning of symptoms. 
So MS can be quiescent for years, and then for whatever reason, a trigger, stress, an infection, a viral infection, um, whatever, can trigger it, and then it can cause these symptoms to flare up. And in the flare, we treat it with, you know, different medications that I, that I talked about. So just wanted to kind of get that out there and, and um, just be aware of, of the symptoms of multiple sclerosis. So you have a question I, there? I would have taken a few more, but I felt like this might be a little bit of an emergency here. Okay. Uh, Mark from, I think he said Maggie, West Virginia. Okay. Uh, he's been sick with the cold and flu, and last night he took some NyQuil to go to bed uh, with Theraflu and Tylenol because he had a fever. And today he said he's waking up with pains in his side, feeling really crummy, and his pee is dark. Okay. Um, what I would recommend, I don't know, how old is he? How old is Mark? You know what? I, I, okay. I didn't even ask him. We don't know any other thinking. medical history or anything like that. Okay. Um, you know, just basically, again, this is not a, you know, right, I can't diagnose right. over the phone, but whenever you notice that your urine is any, any color other than the normal color of, of urine, um, that suggests that there's something going on at the level of the kidney, particularly dehydration. Sometimes we talked about rhabdomyolysis in the past where there's a breakdown of the muscle and that pigment actually is, is you know, distributed through the body and then we urinate and you notice that it looks like tea color. That's a problem because in his case, if he's been sick and he's been dehydrated and he's taken a lot of Tylenol, he's overburdening the liver. And all of these things have, I mean, Theraflu, NyQuil and Tylenol mm -hmm. all have Tylenol in them, it, don't they? It does have Tylenol in it, so we need to be careful, obviously, of the liver. Um, sometimes hepatitis A can present exactly oh, like wow. this. So I'd want to know, you know, how old is he? Is he on any other medications? Um, did he eat anything that may have been not well cooked? Hepatitis A is something that we get through ingesting. Um, it's a virus that attacks the liver that is treatable, that's reversible, but um, I would recommend that Mark get in to see somebody sooner rather than later, gotcha. mainly for IV fluids. Because, you know, if he doesn't get IV fluids and his kidneys shut down, you know, he can end up on dialysis. And, and that's, not, that's not good. You know, I say that because I've had patients exactly like this who ended up on dialysis. So, you know, when I say something, I really don't mean to scare people. I really want you to just be aware that early intervention is what protects the body. And, and that's why if we can do anything in the show, it's really to bring an increased awareness um, to, to what's normal in the body, and if you notice something that's not quite right, get it checked because it can save you a whole lot in the end. And make sure when you're, you know, a lot of people are down and out this time of the year, but try not to mix all the different, read the labels. That's right. It, that's another very, very good point. You know, there's a lot of medicine that can be potentially harmful, even deadly, that we can get over the counter. You know, people think that just because you can get it over the counter that it's safe. Well, that's not true. Um, you know, people can take a handful of Tylenol, and that can be you know, deadly to the liver and end, up refer, and end up requiring a liver transplant, for example, you know, and we've seen that. Wow. So, you know, please be careful. The, I think the message now in this season of colds and flus and diarrhea and infection is to stay hydrated. And if there's any indication within 24 hours, if you can't keep fluid down or you're not getting enough and your urine starts turning very dark, get into an ER. Does and, diet and soda hydrate you? Actually, you know, it, it is a fluid. It's not the best hydrating, um, and, and the reason I say that is because it has caffeine, and caffeine tends to cause constriction of the blood vessels, and so it's not a very good rehydrating fluid. I've never really looked. I wonder if there's a lot of sodium in diet, diet um, there soda. There is. Actually, there is, and, mm. and sodium is good. We, you know, oh, it's it? important to have salt. When we talk about rehydrating the body, water is probably the, one of the best things. Um, but if you drink too much water and you don't have electrolytes with it, like sodium and you know, the potassium and magnesium, what's going to happen is your body's not going to hold on to the fluid. That's why you know, we recommend Pedialyte or we oh, recommend Gatorade. You know, Gatorade or not, Great Air is really not even recommended because it has so much sugar in it. But some of the smart waters, some of the electrolyte waters um, is really the best. And if you don't have that, what I tell my patients is get a bag of potato chips or pretzels. There's salt in it and eat that, and you know, when you're drinking water, that's probably the best hydrating thing that you can do if you don't have access to Pedialyte or some of the other electrolyte uh, fluids. Well, we just, we just helped out the uh, Lay's Potato Chip Foundation hey, across you know, America if we, there's a lot of kids listening today, huh? We, you know, we do that in the hospital. You know, there's an order that I write sometimes that says liberalize salt. So you know, we'll write it, wow. and, and we'll go in the back nice. and, and bring a bag of potato chips into the hospital room 
um, you know, because if somebody is really, you know, dealing with dehydration and blood pressure issues and so forth, you know, obviously we can give them IV fluids, but, you know, to liberalize salt is one way to, to expand the vasculature. That's why when you think about it, people who have high blood pressure, Joe, we recommend staying away from salt, having a low sodium diet, because we don't want the blood pressure to go up and expand that volume, causing the pressure to be high. So dehydration hmm. is just the opposite. That's going to be on my test, that, I can tell. I, absolutely, it is. And, and that's a good, you know, that's something just to kind of keep in mind. Do you have another question there? Uh, we've got Bettina from Yuma. She says, do you have any idea if MSG is as bad as they say? I try not to eat it, but sometimes when I do accidentally, I get hives and my throat swells shut. Very scary. Yeah, you know, well, if you have a, that kind of reaction, for you, it is absolutely, you know, not indicated. You should not use MSG at all. Um, monosodium glutamate is what MSG is for those of you listening. And it's oftentimes found as a preservative in, in foods, Chinese foods, you know, those kinds of things. It is, it's very, very high in salt. And it's interesting because we're talking about salt now. But, but the, the uh, structure, the molecular structure of monosodium glutamate is such that the body has a really hard time um, maintaining it, metabolizing it. And so what it does is it really causes you to what's called third space. It causes you to feel full, fluid overloaded. Those of you listening, um, and I know for myself, if I eat Chinese food that has MSG in it, I feel bloated. My hands swell, you know, those kinds of things. So I absolutely recommend um, avoiding MSG at all costs. I don't eat it. Um, if I ever go into a Chinese restaurant, I always, you know, order without MSG. And now I think most restaurants don't add MSG. Um, there are side effects to it that, honestly, we don't know. We don't know how it's going to affect, you know, the body in terms of um, the toxin and the residual effect of the toxin. You know, we know that certain things that you eat, um, the toxin can remain in the body for who knows how long. Um, you know, if you eat, for example, something that, is, uh, that has high lead level, if you eat, there was a, not long ago a study that came out showing that tuna fish in the can, lead, you know, after you eat that, you know, it can remain in your system for up to six or eight months. So especially in younger children, um, you've got to be really, really careful. So the message is with MSG, um, at all costs, I would recommend avoiding monosodium glutamate because we don't really know what the, what the effects are. Um, you know, anybody that has an allergic reaction with hives, with swelling, with feeling that your throat is closing off, um, that can be life-threatening. And in that situation, we absolutely recommend that you avoid, whether it be an antibiotic, whether it be an aspirin or an anti-inflammatory or a food, shellfish, um, it is something that, that can be life-threatening. We do, however, in, in some cases, give our patients an EpiPen, which is an epinephrine injection that you can keep in your pocket, keep in your purse, so that if you do, for example, come exposed to something in food that, you know, that you're allergic to, um, an EpiPen would help to decrease that, um, that release of histamine, that release of uh, what's causing the throat to close down and, and those kinds of things. While Joe's on the phone, I want to just kind of share with you um, just a, a case that I had in the hospital just within the past week. Um, there's something called epiglottitis. And in the throat, just below where the, the vocal cords close is, is called the epiglottis. And it's kind of like a shelf. And what happens is it automatically, when we swallow, um, to prevent food from going down into the, into the air pipe, into the trachea, it kind of closes one pipe and it opens up the esophagus so that you can swallow food and it doesn't go into the lung. Well, sometimes there's an infection that can, something um, like a bacterial infection, sometimes a viral infection, can cause a swelling and inflammation of the epiglottis. It's the area just under the glottis area where that protection is from the vocal cord. And when that happens, it becomes very inflamed, it becomes swollen, the infection affects the entire area, and it can cause swelling of the throat and the vocal cords actually to be dysfunctional. And so um, anytime you feel that you, ha you can't swallow or that you feel that food is getting stuck or you feel that there's swelling in your throat, the recommendation is to avoid eating anything until you can get in to see a medical doctor because it's a medical emergency if it's untreated. Um, what can happen is it can swell so much that, that the whole air trachea can close off and, you know, if it closes for too long, you don't get oxygen and people can die. 
So it is something that is a medical emergency. So that, again, is something to take serious, um, you know, in that case. Um, I want to talk just a minute about ear infections because it kind of goes a little bit with the whole upper head and neck kind of area. In the ear, there are three parts of the ear. There's the canal, which if you look in the ear, that's kind of what you see. It's the, it's the canal that leads to the eardrum. And then from the eardrum, there's a space that is considered the middle ear. And then inside of that is the inner ear. So we're going to talk about what affects those three areas. Um, people that have swimmers ear, for example, if you go swimming a lot and you feel uh, like pain in the canal of your ear, if you put a lot of you know, Q-tips or a lot of trauma in the ear um, and you develop you know, drainage, that's considered what we call an, uh, ex an externa, uh, no, otitis externa, which is an infection of the external part of the ear. The way we treat that is with ear drops. We can simply put antibiotic drops on the topical area, keep it dry, stay out of the swimming pool, and within you know, seven to 10 days, the infection is pretty much cleared. So that's the area of the ear canal itself where taking antibiotics by mouth really isn't going to do anything because there's not a whole lot of blood flow to that area. It's just kind of a topical um, antibiotic that we recommend. Inside the middle ear, from the, the eardrum to the, to the inter part of the ear, is called the medial, the medium or the middle part of the ear. And people that have ear infections, for example, that cause fevers, chills, um, uh, sore throat, you know, night sweats. A lot of times when you have an ear infection causing that in that area, uh, it's, we, we, it's required to treat it with an antibiotic by mouth or IV. And so ear drops are not going to treat a middle ear infection. And that's real important to know. Um, stuffiness, you know, those kinds of symptoms. Sometimes you can feel dizzy or lightheaded. Not real common um, is a dizzy or lightheadedness, but it's more ear pain uh, and infection and fever and chills. When you get to the inner ear, the inner ear really is where the balance center of the body is. Very rarely do you get an infection in the inner ear because it's really a sterile atmosphere. There's three bones in there, and those three bones sometimes can develop arthritis and causes symptoms of vertigo or dizziness or lightheadedness. Um, that's really inner ear. People who develop a viral infection, for example, with residual inflammation, um, feeling like when you move your head, the whole room spins, that's considered vertigo, and predominantly is the inner ear, and the way we treat that is not with an antibiotic, but with um, medicines that to help to balance the, the, verte the vestibular system in the, in the body. Um, and so that's just kind of important. I wanted to bring that out in terms of the three parts of the ears, the outer, the middle, and the inner. Um, and this time of year, most commonly we're seeing uh, middle ear infections, sometimes inner ear from viruses. Very rarely do we see the externa. In the summertime, externa is very common because people are swimming and there's you know, those kinds of exposures to water in, in the ear. So you have a question there? We have several. Um, Linda, 43 years old from Pensacola, Florida. Had a pork roast for dinner last night, and it was a bit more rare than she likes, oh. but she didn't want to be rude, so she ate it, her and her husband. Wow. They are both extremely ill today, bloating, gas, severe stomach pains, and more. Mm -hmm. Any Absolutely. advice? Um, you know, eating raw meat can be, can be dangerous, period. Um, and the reason that it's dangerous is because there's different types of bacteria that harbor in different meats. What kind of meat was it? Was, was pork. It pork. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's, um, you know, I think of filaria. There, there's a, there's a in infection in the body that can sometimes cause um, the liver to, you know, to be malfunctioning and so forth. But the, the bottom line, I think, is that if you do feel sick today and if it continues to get checked, um, if you can't keep fluids down, that's going to be a problem. The reason that I recommend that you get checked is because oftentimes a bacterial infection from food poisoning oftentimes is not self-limited. You need to get treated with an antibacterial, with an antibacterial, an antibiotic, uh, and an, like if there's a parasite there, you know, there's certain medications that we use to treat that. Um, so that's something that I absolutely would recommend that she take seriously. My mother, uh, being from back east, I think this is a back east thing, my mother always used to tell me as a kid, and she instilled this into my brain, mm -hmm. 
make sure that you're you know don't eat bacon or make sure it's burnt because you're going to get trichinosis is that st- is well, that something you see you do absolutely is that you, that's a disease you have seen you absolutely yes you wow can. i yes. thought that was something that was no. like from the in pork particularly you know beef i mean you know in the, the symptoms that we ask number one is there is there diarrhea is there blood in the diarrhea you know that would that would indicate a pretty severe colitis going on the body's response to this infection in the system. You know, when you think about it, when you eat something, the meat goes in the system, in the digestive tract, in the small intestine, into the, col- into the colon. Um, and if there's a bacteria there or a parasite, you know, which is what, what I would be concerned with, you know, with pork, um, it's there. It's in your system. And there's no way to really get it, you know, get it treated until you either diagnose it, get on the right medication. And the other thing that I would recommend, and this is a real important point, is... People who have diarrhea that have a bacterial or an infectious diarrhea from something that they ate, we don't want to stop the diarrhea. You don't want to take Imodium. You don't want to stop it because you want to excrete it. You want to get that infection out. And that's very important to, to know. So in this case, I would recommend that she get treated for that, sure. That was really nice of you, Linda, not to be rude. But next time, just say, hey, can you nuke, nuke this a little bit for Absolutely. me or something? Absolutely. Don't ever hesitate. You know, what you put in your body, you know, can can affect you. So you've got to be careful what you eat. Hopefully it'll be prepared. okay, but uh, that mm-hmm. could be a heck of a lesson to learn. Woo. Yep. Happy holidays, by the way. What else you got there? Um, Beth Ann, 59 years old, Chicago, Illinois. Uh, I have a cut on my foot that won't seem to heal. Haven't been to a doc in over 20 years. Oh, wow. It's been four months and the cut is still pussy and hurts. Oh my. I feel today like I am getting the flu. I have a fever. Um, well, let's talk about two different things here. First of all, how old? I don't know. How old is she? 59. 59. Okay. Um, you know, when we reach the age of 50, there are certain health maintenance things that, that really should be recommended. Um, colonoscopies, mammography, you know, to really kind of, you know, make sure that, that you're maintaining um, things to help prevent, um, you know, disease processes and so forth. So if you've not been seen for over 20 years, you know, that's something just in and of itself is recommended. Um, the question that I have is, are you diabetic? And the reason that I say that is because diabetes is so prevalent. Um, over 30 million people have diabetes today. I bet she doesn't even know. And that's my question, is you probably don't know. Um, your immune system is down. Anytime we see um, something that doesn't heal on the body, whether it be on the foot, on the hand, um, any part of the body, the first question that we ask is, is there a history of diabetes? Because diabetes tends to inhibit the ability for the body to heal. So that would be my, my first question. If you're still seeing a lot of pus and redness and that kind of thing, it's infected and it needs to be treated. And, and until you get on an antibiotic, it's probably not going to go away. Um, when it comes to the foot, I think we've talked about this before, there's not a whole lot of room, there's not a whole lot of fat, there's not a whole lot of cushion there. And whenever you have an infection, it can extend to the bone because the bone is pretty, pretty close to the surface there. Um, so I would recommend that you get seen, you know, as soon as possible to, to get on an antibiotic and try to figure, you know, figure that out. Get a good physical and see what's going on. You know, no, check your sugar, check your labs, you know, see exactly. I mean, there's th- certain things after 50 you should be doing anyway regularly as a female, right? Yeah, let's just talk about that. Anybody, male or female. Uh, in the female, mammography, mammogram should be something that should have started even, you know, in the 40s. Um, a colonoscopy is recommended for everybody from the age of 50 on. And why? Because, you know, we know that colon polyps um, are are prevalent and, you know, they're very common. And when we find a colon polyp, oftentimes if it's found early, it's just like a, it's like a mole that really doesn't mean anything. It's removed and it's monitored. If you let that mole over years and years grow, it can turn into a cancer and it can be prevented. And that's, that's why colonoscopies are so important to be done you know, as a screening, just to make sure that everything is clean and clear. Um, because by the time the body reaches the age of 50, you know, studies show that, you know, if there's something going to show up, it's going to probably start showing up around that time very early. You know, just like you see these little skin changes on the skin, little, um, like little moles, same thing can happen inside the colon. So that's really very, very important. Today we recommend now uh, everybody be tested for the hepatitis um, you know, virus, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, uh, especially in the baby boomer age. 
because we know that there's a prevalence of hepatitis that really is undiagnosed, and, and that's really very, very important. It's transmitted sexually. It's transmitted through blood. Um, so, you know, you've got to be very careful. And that directly goes and affects the liver, correct? Absolutely. It does, and it causes the liver to eventually, it can fail, but there's a higher incidence of liver cancer in people that have hepatitis as well. So it, it needs to be documented and diagnosed, and when it is diagnosed, we have treatment for it. And, and that's why it is so, it is so um, important to have this all done. Diabetes, in this case, is probably the biggest thing that I would recommend um, for, for our caller, to get some blood work and make sure that you're not diabetic. Thank you, Beth Ann. Let me just kind of throw one more thing out. People, um, just some of the symptoms, you know, people think, well, how do I know if I'm di diabetic? You know, is it, well, a blood test is really the way to test it, but there are symptoms that you can have. Increased thirst. If you find yourself really, really thirsty, more than usual, um, if you find that you're urinating a lot, you know, when you have high sugar in the body, it causes a, like a, for, like a diuresis, and so people get up and urinate like 10, 15, 20 times a day. Um, there's no burning associated with it. It's not an infection. It's just increased urination, increased thirst, um, you know, fatigue, w even weight loss. Initially weight gain, but people who are uncontrolled diabetic end up losing weight, you know, wasting 10, 15 pounds over a month or two um, can signify uncontrolled diabetes, and, and that, that can be a problem. Wow. All right, what Bill, 35, from Atlanta. He spent two weeks in Mexico for the holidays, and he is sick as a dog right now with diarrhea and has not got off the toilet in a, in a week. Okay. Uh, you know, pushing a week, uh, dehydration. I mean, that's the number one thing. That would be the reason to, to go to the ER, make sure that you're not dehydrated, get some IV fluids. Um, diarrhea causes, you know, the loss of fluids, but the loss of electrolytes as well. Potassium, um, you know, your sodium, you know, all of the electrolytes can go down. Why is that important? Because when you have low potassium levels, low electrolytes, you're at a higher risk of developing irregular rhythms with the heart, and it can cause you know, some problems from that standpoint. That's why it's so important to, to make sure that the potassium level is where it should be. Um, but you know, going on a week, this is probably not self-limited. It's probably not just a virus. You may have a bacterial infection. Parasite. You may have a, yeah, colitis. The main things that we check for, when people come in, um, it, you know, and I see somebody, and I would order stool cultures, so obviously we would want to make sure that there's um, the ova and parasite, which is what you just said, salmonella, shigella, something called campylobacter, which is a, which is a bacteria that affects the, you know, the jejunum or the small intestine area, um, E. coli is something that needs to be, you know, looked at, Yersinia is another one. Those are the top bacterias that we look for. Um, and whenever diarrhea is affiliated with bloody diarrhea, it can be more toxic to the body. E. coli can be very toxic, and it can cause a whole array of things to go wrong in the blood, where you develop what's called a coagulopathy, where the, the bleeding uh, coagulation factors you know, go out of whack, and, and you end up bleeding internally, and it can be a real serious thing. In this case, I think you probably just you know, ate something. You, know, you probably have you know, a common you know, foodborne bacterial infection and uh, probably need to, to get on some kind of an antibiotic like Cipro or Levaquin or something like that. But I would definitely, a week, a week long, I would get in to see somebody. And remember, don't drink the water in Mexico. That's, you know, Don't that's, even brush your teeth. That's true. That's absolutely true. With the true. water. Coffee, tea, I mean, that's all made, so you've got to be careful. You, you know, you really have to be careful with, uh, I recommend anybody traveling, there's something called traveler's diarrhea, and anybody that I see, you know, in the, in the, in the clinic, in the hospital that's going, I give them an antibiotic to take with them. You know, it makes sense because if you do start developing, it's better to treat it sooner rather than later. I spent nine months after a trip deep into Mexico. I spent two weeks in Mexico on a fishing expedition. Did you really? I spent nine months when I got back fighting this incredible mm. parasite that I received from. I had um, I was staying in a fishing village with some people, and they oh were my. locals. It was, it was incredible. Mm -hmm. It was an immersion thing I did. And they would cook the fish with the heads on it, you know, oh and gosh. it was different but you know it was great right oh i get so sick i i flies would land on them and everything and oh but when i got back it, they couldn't figure out what was wrong with me it wasn't one of the regular common ones and it ended up um that the good all the good bacteria from my body was gone oh wow so i was on 
bee pollen and, and acidophilus, acidophilus and, yeah. and fibrocon pills and right. i think that's what actually those things are actually what did it for me and got me back over right and the that's top. what i was going to say the, the the pathophysiology when somebody has a just in general an infection in the in the gi system like a bacterial infection the body is an amazing machine it really really is and it tends to try to protect itself so what what happens is the blood flow to the inner lining of the colon tends to automatically constrict because if you think about it, you know, if there's an infection there, the body tends to want to shut down to that area and, and block it, um, which is really kind of an amazing response. But what ends up happening is that you develop what's called an ischemic colitis, meaning that the, the blood flow to the inner lining, the mucosa, the lining of the colon, is decreased. And so w over time, if you have this ischemic colitis over time, you're actually starving the inner lining of the colon from oxygen, from blood flow, and it can actually, you know, necrose and it can die. So it really can be a problem in terms of how the body responds to try to protect itself. That's why it's so important to maintain hydration and to get treated, you know, adequately. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's just important. Before I jump back on and take a few calls, I want to mention something that I read, and I may have read it on one of your blogs because I read so much, so many medical things mm -hmm. lately, you know. Um, onions yes a cut onion in a room was that something you put out yes it uh, was okay mm -hmm. so obviously you know, that's a true thing yeah but. I mean let's talk about that you know it's amazing that first of all onions are very healthy um, there's some studies looking at onions and the effect of helping with arthritis and helping just with bone health osteoporosis osteoarthritis those kinds of things so um, it just helps to increase calcium deposition phosphorus into the bone holding it there to strengthen the bone onions can do have been found to to be beneficial in doing that but what joe's talking about is if you have um, an infection if you have somebody that has pneumonia um, a cold diarrhea whatever the the case may be the case may be if you cut an onion and put it in the room whatever however it works, and I'm not sure how this really works in terms of, you know, what really happens at the level of the onion, but the onion tends to uh, remove certain pathogens from the air. It, it just, for whatever reason, it removes it, and the onion turns black. And I don't know, years ago, there's stories of, that I've heard people, um, you know, just in, in, in different homes and before they went into the hospital or whatever, that uh, these old wives' tales would be, you know, if somebody was sick, they would cut an onion, and the next day they're family member would get better, but the onion would turn black and evidently all the infection was kind of pulled out, you know, into the onion. That's, I think, what Joe was talking about. And there's some research and some literature showing that, yes, in fact, that, that does work. There's a hospital in the Midwest that I read about, and I can't recall the name of the hospital, but um, they actually use this technique, and they actually have onions where they, in, in isolation rooms, patients that are in isolation for whatever infection, respiratory infection, uh, C. diff colitis, they actually, part of their therapy is to put an onion in the corner of the room because they found that that really does help to, to eradicate it. So, you know, for whatever that's worth, it's just something to, to kind of think about. You know, I just wanted to add something to yeah. that. You know, people that go to ball games mm -hmm. and, you know, eat the hot dogs with the onions or even just Costco, you know, this mm -hmm. changed my entire life. Although I don't eat hot dogs, I, I have phobia, I don't like hot dogs too much. But just when I see somebody taking a scoop of those onions that are sitting in that room around all these people is that am i are they eating like this massive bacteria yeah. burger now, well, a hot dog now that's a that's a great point you know and it should be in a closed container oh my you know gosh. if it is in an open container the the possibility of it being contaminated is very real you know and if you're talking about going into costco or going in these because public that's places, how they serve them right yeah probably not a good idea wow. um, yeah I, you would never catch me eating any of that stuff <laughs> Um, but, and I think for our listeners, it's just something to, to really think about. N know what you're putting in your body um, because, you know, there's effects. There's side effects to it, and, and I think that's a very, very real concern. Um, while we're waiting for Joe to get this next call, I just want to bring up, um, I was just talking about isolation and infection and so forth in the hospital. There's a new technique in, that is out now that really helps to um, clean the room. For example, when you go into the hospital, I don't know, but I, you know, one of my concerns always is to make sure that the hospital is as clean as it could be so that if a patient comes in, they're not gonna get an infection of somebody that was in the hospital in that room before. So you know, we have housekeeping come in and then the room is cleaned and, and all of that, disinfected. 
now they have this ultrasound, ultraviolet wand that, um, that we actually bring into the room. And it, the, the mechanism is that it basically destroys any bacteria residual that's left in the space by this high ultrasonic um, beam, I guess it is, that, that, you know, that, uh, yeah, I mean, that basically cleans the bacteria potential that could be left, you know, behind even after housekeeping comes in. And I know that these things are available now for in-home use. Um, and we need to find out, you know, where it is because I think this is something really worth looking into. In the hospital, there's something that we called nosocomial infection. And a nosocomial infection is something that I absolutely hate to see. And we try to limit it, and our numbers are very, very, you know, positive and very good in terms of reducing the number of nosocomial infections in, in the hospital. And what that is is an infection that is gotten while you're in the hospital. So whether it be an infection of the lung, whether it be, you know, a GI infection, C. diff colitis, um, we've got to be very, very cautious and careful. For example, let's say you come in, you know, with a, with a hip fracture, you come in with chest pain, you know, we don't want you to be contaminated to the point where you end up picking up something and leaving the hospital sicker than when you came in. And that's basically what we mean by that. So nosocomial infection is something that, um, that I take very, very serious as a hospitalist and making sure that the environment that I'm treating my patients in um, is the best environment that we possibly can treat them. And so, you know, we're moving to get this ultrasound, ultrasonic, uh, device, and I'm not sure exactly what what the name of it is, but it is something that you know that our nursing staff is is looking into, and I think it's really something to uh, to think about. When you're in the hospital, for people listening out there, if you have a family member in the hospital, or you know, if, God forbid, you end up in the hospital, be aware that there are things in the room that can potentially harbor inf harbor infection. The TV remote, for example, you know, the, w when they do studies, we look at the highest burden of like bacterial infection can be on the telephone in the room. Can be um, just like if you go into a hotel, things that you need to think about to kind of you know make sure that you don't you know use or touch um, in the hospital the bed rail you know to make sure that you know that that's all cleaned and and we take you know extra steps to make sure that that's done. But I recommend that our patients actually be aware of that as well so that, you know, so that you're kind of keeping your eyes out for your family member, for example, if they're in the hospital to, to make sure that that in fact is done. And if you see, if you're in a hospital anywhere in the country and you see that there is something that doesn't look clean, uh, it is vital that you report it. Uh, make sure that the, that the nurse knows, make sure that the charge nurse, whoever you know, it's very, very important because if they don't know, they can't, they can't take care of it. And, um, and we see, you know, we see that, and I just think it's important moving into the new year to keep this kind of stuff, these things in mind so that, you know, again, we can limit bad outcomes as much as possible. Um, Joe, you have some questions there? Uh, yes, Suzanne from Nashville says, love the show. She would just like to know, she's always wondered, can you catch things from kissing your dog or are there any diseases that are spread between dogs and people? And, you know, that's awful because I must be loaded with, with things. You know, me too. And, Suzanne, that's a great question. As far as I know, no, I'm not, a, I'm not an infection disease specialist, nor am I a veterinarian. But um, from an internal medicine standpoint, the, the diseases that dogs get um, and the diseases that humans get in terms of the immune system response are not compatible. So chances are um, just by casual exposure, you're not going to get, an infection, you know, from, you know, kissing your dog or being around your dog. I mean, obviously, if there's saliva that, you know, that is, that, you know, that it touches your, your saliva and that, you know, you've got to be careful if they're sick, you know, the, those kinds of things. But for the most part, um, I, I don't know of any case that was reported where somebody was, was affected by a deadly illness that they got from a domestic animal. Um, that's why it's important to get shots and, and those kinds of things for, for the dog. Um, now, if the dog, the dog is sick, I mean, they get their rabies, and you know what I mean, right, they get their right. shots. But if a dog is sick, let's say if they have valley fever, here in Arizona, valley fever, the question is, can we catch valley fever from our dog? The answer to that is, I don't think so. Um, I don't know of any studies reported where humans can actually catch, um, you know, these kinds of infections from, from the dog. Now, if anybody out there knows any different, I would love to hear from you, but... Uh, you know, I mean, I kiss my dog and, you know, I'm... You know, I couldn't uh, imagine not kissing my dog. Yeah. I do have the five-minute rule, though. Mm -hmm. You know, when he licks his butt... Yeah, you got to be careful. Five right? minutes of no kissing him at all. 
But Sorry, for, that was gross. But for the most part, <laughs> you know, from a from a pathophysiology and a pathogen standpoint, I don't know of any of any you know disease that is really gotten that way. All right, and thank you, Suzanne. You can now, kiss your dog. Let me just tell you, universal precautions in general need to be in play, and you know whether it be with our dogs, whether it be with dogs, whether it be with you know our the, our loved ones that we live with. You, you want to make sure that you, that you practice universal precautions. What is that? Basically, you know, washing your hands. You know, you don't want to, you know, touch your dog and be, your, you know, if they were in dirt or, you know, and then touch your mouth or eat something. I mean, just general rules like that, I think, will help to keep you out of trouble, um, whether it be with humans or with dogs or, you know, whatever. Because, you know, you really think about it. One thing, I, one thing that I didn't think about until not to, I, I start thinking about a little more in depth. Mm-hmm. But, you know, your dogs, they walk around. And they don't think too much about maybe walking around and stepping accidentally in their own. Right, right. And, and you know, then they jump up on your bed. Right. And that kind of, you know, that's like... Mm, I mean, those are universal precautions. That are, they are. You know, that's right. universal precautions. But I think just in general... So now um, I wipe my dog's feet down with alcohol swabs when he comes in. Probably a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Perry from Jacksonville. Um, was recently in hospital for a minor surgery, and I noticed I was given the wrong IV bag. It had a different name on it. Do you recommend any pre-surgery or post-surgery advice to ensure we get the highest quality control? Yeah, I mean, I think being aware of it is absolutely important. Do not be afraid to ask questions. If you see something... It is not insultive, right, to ask a question? Absolutely not. If you see something, you know, and you're the patient or your family member is a patient, and you don't understand it, um, you are really supposed to ask questions. I mean, you you know, you're called to, on their behalf... Not be afraid to ask a question. If you see something that doesn't quite look right, if it's a different name on the antibiotic, don't be afraid to ask. Chances are it's probably a generic name or, you know, a different name that's on the bag or, you know, whatever. But I think that the nurse or the physician should just be able to, you know, tell you that. And if it'll calm, you know, you in terms of settling and and making sure that you're not anxious about it, that's what we intend to do is make sure that you don't have any question marks, that you're comfortable with the care that you're getting. Um, And if you see something definitely do not hesitate to ask questions. I'm one of these terrible, terrible hypochondriacs. Whenever I get done with the show, I always have five new ailments. You really do. That's, but, that's funny. But um, I, had a, I had a surgery. I had my shoulder rebuilt, and when I went in, I had a friend of mine sent me this show on, it, it was probably not the right thing to watch, but about somebody goes in to get their, you know, finger mended, and they leave with no right leg. Oh, and yes. Right. Things like, you know, crazy stuff. Mm-hmm. So So I went in, and... I asked him, I said, can you please mark? Because this show recommended they mark. They said, oh, we do that anyway. They do. I and mean, yeah, they're Sharpies and they're marking. And you know, I mean, it was for, awesome. I think it's important for listeners to know there are certain things and criteria that it, within the hospital that are measured. And one of the, I mean, there are benchmarks. You know, so, for example, if somebody comes into the hospital with chest pain, I mean, there's a protocol that we have to match to make sure that we're following standard of care. You know, aspirin, beta blocker, medications treating for heart attacks. When, when somebody goes to surgery, for example, on a limb, it is, it is mandatory that they mark that side. And when that is not done, which I don't even, I can't even remember a case when that wasn't done, um, it's reportable. It is something that we are held to the highest of standard. And if somebody sees that that's not being done, um, you, we really, you know, you're called to, to, to bring it up. I mean, to, to make sure that you notify somebody if, if that's the case. And, and I do want to bring one thing up. Um since they're the sponsors of this show but and because of that it's just as important the gilbert hospital and the florence hospital at anthem have extra precautions in that like like having a hospitalist like yourself on staff right you know the the idea is to is to limit human error you know to limit human error i mean that's i mean that's got to be the most important thing it really is in medication administration um, name bans, making sure that you know the right person is being treated we may have somebody in the hospital with the same name you know so Having a hospitalist there, and we've talked about this before, is, is having somebody that's basically running, you know, running the show in terms of managing if there's other specialists coming and going, um, somebody that is there intimately related to the patient, the staff, and making sure that what needs to be done is, is obviously done in the right way um, to the best of our ability. Now, you know, when it comes to surgery, there's a whole protocol in place in the pre-op position and in the post-op position. And those, it's almost like a check mark that, that, is, that they go by. And, and that's very, very important to know. Sometimes the smaller hospitals, you get more personal care. You know, there's, there's more of an intimate relationship 
when you're in a smaller hospital versus a huge, you know, university hospital where, you know, where there's maybe 10 or 12, you know, whereas a smaller hospital, maybe there's only two or three. So you, you can actually get more directed personal care to limit and minimize um, error. I, mean, that's I, I was, very, I was very amazed important. when I went to the Gilbert Hospital to get a, just a, an x-ray done of my wrist, just an outpatient quick thing in and out. They got my ID. They made a tag for my hand, right. and they double um, check it. They and then triple, somebody check triple check it. That's it. Right. right. It I was very. I felt. I felt very good about that. Right. In order to get medication out of the, um, out of the, you know, the medication where they distribute, where they get the pain meds from the pharmacy, um, you've got to not only put in the number, put in the name, but you've got to double it, and you've got to have somebody else double check you. So, you know, giving narcotics, for example, you can't just go get it and distribute it. You've got to have somebody, you know, double. You're. you're we're doing everything possible to minimize human error. And remember, guys, it's not because we're worried about, you know, people out of the hospital dealing narcotics. This right. is for your protection Absolutely. and your safety so you're not taking the wrong pills or overdosing right. and double taking things. Exactly. It's for your safety. Exactly. We, we've, had a, we've had a really, really good year. Um, we have a quality, um, quality committee, you know, quality assurance committee. And, and, um, and we, we've really had, you know, some, some good reports come out from a surgical standpoint, from a nosocomial standpoint in terms of infection rates and those kinds of things, um, door to dock, you know, getting in and, and getting treated in a timely manner, people that come in with a heart attack into our ER, the time that we can get them to the cath lab to treat that heart attack, less than 90 minutes um, has been met consistently time and time again. So there are a lot of benchmarks that we're held accountable to. Plus both um, hospitals have the helicopters right up right. on the roof Absolutely. right there. You don't have to rely on a third party flying Ab in from Phoenix. Absolutely, that's right. Um, and so just getting back to that question, uh, Suzanne, that called with the IV, if you, it is important that we do um, treat with the pre-op antibiotic, pre and post uh, surgery. So if you saw that, and let's say you were on a regular antibiotic that was maybe given to you for a urinary infection or whatever, and you see a different name, oftentimes that's part of the protocol for the surgical intervention, you know, preoperatively and postoperatively. So um, there are reasons that we do certain things uh, to follow protocol. So I would just ask if you have questions in a, in a specific way. Fantastic. Do you have any other questions, Joe? We still have callers coming in. Okay. Um, you want me to take a couple more? Yeah, we have like three minutes left. Why All don't right. you Let's see why if don't I can't grab another one. Okay, that sounds good. You know, I just want to, uh, we were talking about nutrition. And vitamin B12, there's, deficiencies can lead to certain uh, medical conditions. And B12 is one of those that I want to just talk about for, for a minute. Um, there are certain vitamins that it's impossible to overdose on. For example, vitamin B, vitamin C, those are the water-soluble vitamins. And this time of the year, um, with you know the f cold and flu, we recommend really kind of beefing up on vitamin C to improve the immune system and beef it up. Vitamin B12, in particular, is one of those vitamins that um, people can be lacking in and not know it. And, and how vitamin B12 deficiency presents is you can just feel tired, feel fatigued. Um, people that have had, for example, gastric bypass surgery, they're at a high risk of, of not being able to absorb vitamin B12 from the food, from, you know, and so oftentimes they, um, they require vitamin B12 shots. So just something to kind of keep in mind in terms of deficiencies, um, thyroid problems, underactive thyroid, sometimes the symptoms you can have um, numbness, tingling, those symptoms that, that go along with the underactive thyroid that mimic um, B12 deficiency. So the, the, the two kind of go hand in hand, and we just want to kind of throw that out there so that moving into the new year, um, if you've not, you know, had your physical and you have some symptoms and so forth, you know, a very easy fix, um, but if you don't get it checked out, you're not going to, you're not going to know, and, and, you know, it could really make a difference in, in your energy level and, and in your life. That was a nice call from uh, Janet Friends at uh, Fiesta Mall Dillard's. They oh, said, wow. Happy New Year. Great oh, show. Oh, that's neat. Very good. Happy so, New Year to you. That's, that's great, Janet. Right Thank you. Thanks for calling. Anybody else, Joe, you have that? I, I think we're caught up okay. right now. Um, the last thing I want to talk about today before, before we close is something called radiculopathy. We were talking a little bit about nerves and numbness and tingling. There's something that is called radiculopathy. And, you know, it kind of sounds ridiculous, but, but what it is basically is um, if you have an impingement on a nerve, whether it be in your neck, in your back, and you feel pain going down your arm, or down your leg in a way that feels like an electrical, um, you know, like an electric impulse or an electricity, or like, you know, that's kind of what it feels like. It, that basically is nerve pain. 
and oftentimes, you know, we've had people come in with, you know, shoulder pain or arm pain and really thinking that the problem was in the arm when in fact it stems from the neck. So sometimes arthritis in the cervical spine can cause an impingement on the nerve that is responsible for, you know, extending all the way down the, the arm. So if you have like thumb pain or numbness or tingling or discomfort in the forearm, oftentimes it's not at the site of the forearm, it's actually stemming from the neck. And that's really very, very important to, to know. One way we treat that is with vitamin B complex, vitamin B6, vitamin B12, because what that does is it helps to regenerate that nerve sheath. Remember earlier on today's show, we were talking about multiple sclerosis and the sheath, the anatomy of it? it has nothing to do with MS, but the anatomy of it is that B6, B12 helps to regenerate and strengthen that, that covering on the nerve. And it helps it to fire more effectively um, and protect the nerve. If you have an impingement on a nerve over time, if you just think about pressure, consistent pressure, it's going to cause that nerve to almost deaden. And over time, that nerve may not regenerate. So um, just to be aware of if, you know, if, if it is something that you know, people experience, oftentimes it's not the site of the hand or the foot. It's actually traced back up to the origin of where the nerve is coming out of the spinal column. Sciatica is an example. Carpal tunnel is an example. Um, you know, cervical, what we call spondylo spondylolisthesis, which is kind of a little arthritic growth of the uh, of the spinal um, bony formation around the area where the nerve comes out. Doesn't take much to put something in there to send stuff all over the place. It so. doesn't. It doesn't. So just be aware of that. And um, and exercise is really very important to strengthen muscles. Um, you know, to help with that neuropathic type pain. So those are the things that I wanted to, to kind of share with you as we move into the, into the new year. Joe, we're out of time. It's another amazing show, our Good. first of 2013. All right. Well, hopefully we have some really great uh, shows lined up this year um, with some neurologists coming in and different specialists. And I really just like opening it up question and answer just to you know, kind of keep the phones open and, and talk. Do we have a guest next week? That Actually, we, we do. I, I, I need to confirm it. I'll let you okay. know. Um, you know. And once we confirm it, then we can Absolutely. let the folks know. Absolutely. All right. All right. Happy New Year to you guys out there. This concludes Doc Talk Radio with Dr. Ann Borick. Till next time, I wish you health, wellness, and many blessings. Doc Talk Radio is brought to you by Gilbert Hospital and Florence and Anthem Hospitals. Topics discussed are for informational and not intended to substitute advice from your personal physician.